In the name of the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There are two images of our Lord Jesus that I want to share with you today. And they are shaped by our gospel reading. Now, the first is of our Lord standing in the temple courtyard, and he's about to deliver what is to be his last public teaching. And his are words of grace-filled guidance. And they're addressed to his disciples and the many attendees at the temple. But there are also words of spiritual advice addressed to us also here. You will recall that Jesus had just had a number of verbal interactions, let's call them that, with the Pharisees, and the religious leadership. And these were religious scholars who made it their life's vocation to study the Mosaic law of Torah, the Old Testament, and to interpret it, its application to daily life, to ensure that holiness of life was observed in daily living. And to do this, there's a strong focus on avoiding ritual defilement whenever possible. And they did make accurate analyses as far as doctrines went. They truly and accurately taught God's law. For example, divine decree. God's providence, God's blessings, the immortality of the soul, the resurrection of the body, the existence of angels, these were all Pharisaic teachings, no doubt about it. In seeking guidance for daily life, the people were greatly helped by these skilled interpreters of Torah. And their teachings were more orthodox than many others. And as a result, they were to be expect, uh, respected. And so as Jesus speaks to the crowd, our Lord does not condemn the scribes and the Pharisees' teaching. With an abundance of grace, he affirms the good points of these religious leaders, their ability to teach faithfully from God's law as given to Moses. So Jesus tells his listeners to observe and do as they say. However, our Lord is careful to express a clear word of caution to his listeners, separating their word and teaching of the Pharisees from their own displayed actions, their behaviors in the public eye, so to speak. Jesus warns his hearers against using such persons as worthy examples of righteous or godly living. He laments the leadership examples many of them displayed. And his words are uttered with clarity. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, that seat of teaching authority. Therefore, do what they teach and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. So here's the question. Do we hear our Lord's words of caution as being valid, are they relevant to us to this very day? Do we hear Jesus revealing his caring heart, reminding us that the word of God is alive when it's our actions that speak? Because our actions speak more eloquently than our words. In contemporary parlance, we need to walk the talk. But our Lord's disappointment also comes through clearly as he described aspects of their behaviors that were inconsistent with their teachings. There were major discrepancies between preaching and actual practice, amounting, as Jesus says, to that of hypocrites, which in the meaning of the original Greek text of the gospel, it means role-playing stage actors. It's all an act rather than the genuine commitment to what God 
desires of his people. And so now here's the second image of our Lord that I want to share with you this morning. Jesus is on a Galilean mountainside. He's surrounded by his disciples and a crowd has gathered. And here is how Matthew describes it. When Jesus saw the crowd, he went up the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began to speak and taught them. What was the context of his teaching? He gave them living examples of what the law required. Jesus went on to stress this word of caution. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That was from the, remember, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, not chapter 23 where we are now. Jesus was consistently clear as he instanced the portrait of pride and vanity evident in the lives of many Pharisees. And he pointed out that faithful teaching manifests itself at two levels, content and conduct. Authentic teaching requires that there be consistency between these. And truth to tell, there were occasions when our Lord did experience authenticity among many Pharisees. There were, among early followers of Jesus, many Pharisees also. Remember Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea? These were some not notable examples. Also, positive, mutually respectful, relationships also existed between Jesus and some Pharisees. On a number of occasions, he shared table fellowship, debating with them in a friendly manner. And in these, we see yet another image of the caring heart of Christ, God incarnate, who delights when we embrace the grace of amendment of life. Paul, remember, Paul, was one such. A Pharisee who sat at the feet of Gamaliel, that great teacher, along with a number of other Pharisees and even some of the priests who quite strikingly believed and did come to faith in Jesus. So let's be clear. Not all the Pharisees held these negative qualities described in today's Gospel reading. This is not how Jesus viewed each and every Pharisee that he knew. Our Lord was not intending to write off all Pharisees as pious, hypocritical, self-righteous legalists. God writes off nobody. Did you hear that? He writes off nobody. There is something I heard many years ago that in a certain tribe in Central Africa, when someone did something terrible, what they did was they brought that person in the center of the, of the gathering. What do you think they did? They surrounded that person and spoke of all the good things that that person did. Because what they wanted to do was to remind that person of that person's worth in the sight of the community. They believed in the good of their fellow person. That is what I believe is in the heart of our Lord regarding each and every one of us. No one's perfect. And there was in, that, in those temple precincts that day, that Wednesday of Holy Week, in our Lord's heart, there was grief, heavy grief. Grief for those stage actors who would soon put him to death. And also for the crowds around him who would soon be shouting, crucify him. But in the face of it all, our Lord perseveres with a word of advice to all who would listen regarding the danger of falling into a trap of 
seeking popularity and power and becoming so blinded, so clouded by praises that one loses one's sense of identity and becomes self-righteous. Loving places of honor, as he said at banquets, seats of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces and salutations. Rabbi. And thirdly, Jesus tells his disciples, don't seek to be called rabbi. That's not for you. You are but one teacher, and you're all fellow students. Isn't that wonderful? We're all in process. We're all learning to imitate our Lord. Call no one on earth your father, for you have one father in heaven. And that was not new. The prayer, that, that prayer the, which is said at the, at the end of, of life, says, our Father, our King, our Lord. It's a, it's a prayer of dedication. Jesus wanted to warn both his own disciples and others who would follow across the ages about the temptations that honors and titles present. And these would cause ministers of the gospel to draw attention to ourselves instead of to God and God's sacred word. And so the Lord summarizes the message of our gospel today, urging us to serve one another and to do so with humility and sincerity rather than with pride and self-promotion. And here's another beautiful thing about our dear Lord Jesus. For his part, Jesus never told anyone to do anything that he himself did not demonstrate. He washed his disciples' feet. He laid down his life on the cross. It was an offering and a sacrifice wholly sufficient and never to be repeated. And all for our redemption from sin and death. So what does this say? O oh Lord, self-sacrificial actions say to us one and all, you are loved, you are graced, you are forgiven, redeemed, and now you are free to live for others as I have lived for you. Is there anything that we could offer? Anything we could ever offer in return? Yes, there is. Our deepest gratitude. Our gratitude for the benefits of eternal salvation which he's lavished upon us. And how do we express this? We hear and we obey our Lord's teaching. Remember, he says, the one who would be greatest among you should become the servant of all. Seek in your daily lives the glory of God, not your self-glorification. And he demonstrated what he meant, not only by speaking about servant leadership, he lived it himself. Isn't this so typical of our Lord? He takes what the world loves, expects, and he turns it on its head. He upends it. The greatest in the kingdom of God isn't the celebrity or the one in great positions of power. The greatest one in the kingdom is the one who is doing the serving. So who might these be? And that's why the gospel of good news is good news. All of us. That's us. Each and every one of us. The opportunities open to us are truly endless. And here are a couple of examples, or just a few. The person who is looking for ways to serve God by sharing the gospel of Jesus with others as they know in everyday life. It's the person who is not above others and takes on tasks that others don't want to touch. It's the church member who stays a few minutes late each week to, to clean up and to tear down. It's the person who looks for God's grace in the lives of others, who is able to identify spiritual gifts in their fellow members, discerning what good qualities he's blessed them with and explores ways to encourage them, to show appreciation for them, to support them, to affirm them. What counts is what we do for God and the people whom he has created and whom he loves. And we've already seen our Lord's great example of humility. There are many examples in the gospel. So let us all strive to live 
in imitation of Christ. His redeeming, transformative work continues in our midst. Was that a wonderful hymn? All these saints, and we aim to be one too? That means us. Yeah, yeah, we are. You know, in that second image of our Lord on the Galilean mountainside, he spelled it out for us, and he describes human life. This is how our dear Lord put it. He says, look for the servant leaders among the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Sound familiar? Servant leaders will be found among those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Among the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Servant leaders are found among those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Among the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Servant leaders are found among the pure in heart, for they will see God. And especially in these troubled, challenging times, Servant leaders will be found among the peacemakers, the children of God. They'll also be found among those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These, these, says the Lord, are the marks of his invitation to us. Our Lord invites us to follow him. So let's live out the words of our faith. And to help us live it day by day, he gives us his Holy Spirit to strengthen, to teach, to lead, and to guide. The Lord knows we need it. Especially as we celebrate this solemnity of all his saints, as we hold in our hearts those who are near and dear to us, who have gone before us and are in his greater presence. We need it for his means of grace, for the hope of glory in joy and in sorrow, in life and in death, now and to the end of the ages. Blessed be O Lord, Christ Jesus. Amen.